This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Matteo Communications. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Let's talk for a moment about brand awareness in the cannabis space. The industry is obviously becoming more crowded as it matures. So how do you effectively break through the noise? We all know cannabis marketing has restrictions that make our jobs more difficult. But fortunately, the kick-ass PR and marketing professionals at Matteo Communications know how to elevate your narrative while staying compliant. Their New York and LA-based teams have the connections and powerful storytelling abilities you need to propel your brand onto the national stage. Matteo refuses to let your bold innovations and ambitious breakthroughs fall through the cracks. They'll get your company in front of your most prized audiences via their specialties, which include PR, social media, investor relations, SEO, and more. Matteo shares your vision of normalizing cannabis for the greater good of society. They proudly partner with businesses across the industry, from investors and ancillary companies to large MSOs and local brands. No matter your business goals, Matteo is here to help. Email them today at info at matteo.com. That's I-N-F-O at symbol M-A-T-T-I-O dot com or visit their website at matteo.com to get your company the recognition it deserves. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Rob Seacrest. He's the president of Polaris Equity Group and co-manager of the Polaris Fund. Hey, Rob, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. I'm really uh, excited to be talking with you today. I, as I mentioned before we started recording, you know, when it comes to the real estate space within the cannabis industry, um, you know, I've had a, I can think of one or two guests that I've had on in that space. And so that to me is, is, is fairly new. And I'm really excited to be exploring that, that sector of the industry more with you today. Of course, you being the co-founder and president of the Polaris Equity Fund. Um, so let's first kick off, Rob, before we dive into that, let's talk a little sense about your background. From what I read, I know that you have over 18 years of experience in the real estate finance industry. So tell us a little bit about that and kind of how your experience in those 18 years was a real culmination to make this transition into cannabis. Sure. Um, I'll try to make it as quick as possible because I think that the other stuff is more interesting. But um, <laughs> I'm coming from a family of entrepreneurs um, uh, and I was in the medical field, medical sales. Um, then I went and launched my own action sports company. I sold that company at the age of 25 and I had gotten it to about 2.4 million in revenue uh, with 30 employees um, wow. with 10 percent of uh, pre-tax profits. But that was my MBA of, of business. Um, I, I realized that I need to do bigger transactions, shorter sales cycles, and pull out that 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 pre-tax money out, uh, extract it. Because with that company, that that uh, that profit was only there if we could collect all the receivables, which ran at the time I sold 1.6 million. So that made me pivot um, to uh, doing larger transactions, shorter sales cycle, and get paid at the close. Real estate. And so I went into real estate finance uh, and uh, the bigger transactions you can do, the, the, the more you better it utilizes your time. And so I was doing international finance, um, big projects. And uh, that was in 1999. I, I think it's actually more than 18 years now. But, um, you know, here we are today. Uh, my, my partner and I formed Polaris in 2010. Um, between uh, him and myself and our team, we've done over a billion dollars over 5,000 trans transactions in the value add lending space. And that term value add to explain that vernacular in our world, that simply means that we're doing um, uh, transactions where a portion of the loan amount is being held back for a pre-approved budget to go back into the property. Typically ground up construction, fix and flip, tenant improvements, or it could even be entitlements for that project. And so that's a very specific type of lending because it's harder to underwrite, but also once you close, it's not a purchase, purchase or, act, or refinance where you're done, you just collect payments. You actually have to continue to work and process those draw requests to reimburse the borrower for the improvements that they made to the property that were part of that budget. So that's the lane that we're in. And kind of how we got here is that um, we used to get our investors about 11 to 12% uh, monthly uh, uh, disbursements of, of yield. 
And over time, the market got so competitive um, that those yields started getting down to between six and 9%. And so that was compounded with the loan to value, the ratio of how big the loan is to the value of the property also started to increase to be able to put the capital out faster. So typically 65% is about the max that, that most uh, private lenders are willing to go to. That, that, those percentages went to 70, 75, 80, and even 90% on purchase. And we're like, we've seen this before. We've been through multiple uh, downturns in our career. We're just not gonna lend out any money um, right now. We're gonna let the market shift out and we don't wanna, it's not worth it to have our investors be exposed to that additional credit risk. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment, Dana Rohrbacher is our local congressman here uh, in Orange County, California, and we're friends with him. And he passed the Rohrbacher Blumenauer Amendment. This was the most massive amendment in the entire cannabis industry that, I, that nobody knows about, or very few people know about. And what this amendment did is it defunded the Department of Justice from prosecuting any cannabis related business hmm. in a medically licensed state. So what that meant is that no matter what administration was in power, Congress, separate branch of the government, had used the power of the purse to defund uh, the Department of Justice. So there was no ability that if the Trump administration came in and was aggressive against cannabis, that they could do anything. Or if the Biden administration came in, that they could do anything. So that amendment being in place made us go, OK, we are some of the most experienced value add lenders in the space. And the yields in the non-cannabis are so compressed that it doesn't make sense. Let's really deep, take a deep dive and look at going into this other sector. And what we realized is that there was nobody out there at all and that we had the skill set. So we started originating our first transactions in 2016. Since that time, we've done 50 transactions for 177 million in just this sector alone. And we've had uh, 22 payoffs. And interestingly enough, most people don't realize that of the 695 banks out there that are doing depositor relations across the country, of those 695 banks, many of those banks, probably at least five, maybe up to 10% are lending directly to cannabis lenders. So the fact that there's no banking, that Congress is trying to solve this, that, 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 that there's all this cash floating around, is not the case for depositors. It's only the case for, for um, dispensaries. They're still having to take cash at dispensaries because they can't take credit cards. So right. that's where the disconnect is. But all the rest of the industry, if any of our borrowers ever came to us and didn't have regular banking, we'd be like, dude, what, what planet are you on? We've never even seen it. So um, that's, that's a big misnomer out there. And it's a big mis misnomer that there's no banks uh, lending in the space as well. Lots of state banks and credit unions are, are lending across the country in their medic in the states that are already doing bank uh, that are already approved for medical license. And I'm glad that you clarify that, right? Because of course it's going to be those those institutions that are within the state where it's legal to do so, whether from a medical or or adult use standpoint, right? Um, so when we still talk about at the federal level, the major large private institutions, you know, they're it seems like they're more hesitant still at least on the, the banking, like, you know, opening up a, a checking account and actually allowing for credit card payments in your dispensary. There's, it seems like they're still hesitant on that area at the federal level. Yeah, I'm happy to explain what the disconnect is there. Yeah. <clears throat> any, any bank can accept a cash deposit from any, any person, whether it's a cannabis or non-cannabis. So if you're non-cannabis, it's a suspicious activity report if it's over $10,000. If it's cannabis, it's called an MSARS, a Marijuana Suspicious Activity Report. The problem is the reason the banks don't accept those deposits is that when you accept that cash deposit, you have to be able to track every one of those dollars from the originator who, built, who's, who created the cannabis uh, and the, the, the buyer who, who purchased it. So there's a money trail that you can deposit that. And so banks are not set up with that infrastructure to take the onboard those deposits. It's not worth losing your banking license for a $10,000 deposit. So it doesn't make economic sense. Plus there's political ramifications with some, with the board may not be on board with it, or they may have uh, other things that are, are a conflict of interest, but the banks that, of the 695 banks that are doing it, what they do is they actually have it's tier one banking is the banking for cannabis for, for uh, plant touching. T 
tier two slash three is ancillary, which is what we are. Mm -hmm. But what they do is they charge for a deposit so that they're, they've got it bu built into their fee structure. So it's typically, you know, up to 0.3% per deposit. Plus you're actually paying a monthly fee that's substantially higher, anywhere from 500 to $1,500 a month. Right. So that's, that's the difference. And so it's not that banks can't do it. It's just not worth it to them to go down that road for, for many different reasons. Well, and there's, there's layers to that, right? Cause I actually um, am going through that process right now. So a, a company that I own cannabinoid nation, we're launching an e-commerce store within it. And to your point, yes, like, there are those added fees, like anywhere from three to four to five percent for each transaction fee, and then plus the monthly fee to for service for maintenance, right? Because the the bank is is claiming that they're making sure that they're monitoring as regulations change and they're keeping you compliant, right? Yeah. But, but then there's an also layer, and isn't that layer the merchant processing bank? That, so essentially, there's two banks, right? Yeah. If, Right. I, I'm going to try to break this apart. So it sounds yeah. like you're ancillary. You're not in the, you're not plant touching, are you? No, no. Mm -mm. Yeah. So you're in the wrong channel of banking. You need to be in tier two slash three, which is ancillary, which there's no additional charges. So in that, in tier two slash three, that just means that you can't be debanked for, for being associated with the cannabis industry, which for us, when we have, you know, 40 trust accounts with, you know, Lots and lots, tens and tens of billions of dollars. We can't afford to be deplatformed from the bank and move everything in right. thirty <laughs> right. days. So, um, in tier two slash three, at least our bank, that there's no additional charges. It's just different different level of um, background check that you go through. Now, so I'm trying to, to separate those two things. Now, merchant banking is a total separate lane altogether. Right. So, um, if you're talking about merchant banking. As far as I know, there is no merchant banking happening directly on credit cards or, or rails out there. If there are, you're, you're, uh, that, they're, they're running that, they're doing that without being caught. There's some other, other uh, processes that people have put in place. Most of them just take a, uh, an ATM card and have you pay, pay cash right then and there. There's also some other companies that have come up with some alternative things that our bank accepts called hyper um, as a payment processing system. And that's with a, ends with a UR hyper with a UR. Um, but uh, I, I think that those are all different things. So you got plant touching that right. pay, the, that, pay the, that, that for depositors that pay a big um, premium, then tier two slash three, which shouldn't be any additional. And then merchant banking still doesn't exist to my knowledge at this time yet. I may have misspoke when I said uh, we're non plant touching, because I guess we would be if we're drop shipping, products okay. right like we're yeah. not if you're drop shipping, yeah if, if you're drop shipping products then you're moved into the like into tier one so tier so definitely tier one so thank okay phew right because i was like <laughs> okay you know did i do the right thing or because we're yeah, good yeah. there <laughs> that's, that's good yeah and then with merchant processing i mean i i guess they've found a way to work with specialty merchant processing banks to because like we went through a rigorous process like we had to have the site up, up like completed all the inventory on the site so that the merchant processing bank could do a thorough like verification and and they were super strict like even when it came to edibles they allowed for gummies but not for caramels you know what i mean so they wow. kind of set their own parameters of what's right and what's not but it seemed to be very subjective and because there's you know there's really no like because again, of the schedule one regulation, right? There's no kind of federal guidance on all this mm. yet. So that was interesting, but yeah, I, I, I don't know with that. When you bring up that with virtual so, processing. So yeah. on your site, which is massive, if you can use credit cards to process it in lieu of a wire transfer, that's major. Um, and so if you've got that worked out, that's, that's, a, that's a huge uh, win for you. Um, we're not on that side of the business. We're not, uh, we don't, right. we are, we're lending to the owners of the properties and their tenants are the, are the are the cannabis use business and they're they're setting up the merchant account so but i hadn't heard of one being in place yet I'm, I, I'm i'm happy to hear that it exists let's after we stop recording i'm gonna give you all the info and then you can tell me kevin you got to be careful or <laughs> wow like you know this is new because it's it's been like five months rob like we've gone through extensive like i mean it's taken yeah. a long time yeah so there there are people that were processing I, I i can't remember who it was but there was a major bank processing and they just got caught uh recently and they were just 
letting it go. And there were such a big bank. I think that they just thought that it wouldn't, it would just get buried in there. So yeah. Yeah. Happy to have a conversation off the line. <laughs> awesome. Well, Hey, let's get back to Polaris. So you mentioned that when the amendment passed and you had, you had formulated and started the company, I think in 2010 is what you said. So like, at that point, the amendment, it was just like, you guys saw this opportunity. You saw that there was little to no competition. Yeah. Um, and so is that kind of how it was born? Yeah. So we're a fairly small company and our claim to fame is that we are forward thinkers and we are looking for opportunities, whether it's a new market or, or a new way to structure a product uh, is, is what we do. So for example, in 2010, our kind of claim to fame back then, if you, if you remember, that's when the great recession hit and there was all of these massive amount of properties that were at the lowest purchase price basis that you could ever have. That's actually when you wanna buy all the properties, <laughs> but nobody was lending. And on, on top of that, you had all of these very experienced um, uh, builders and developers that had lost everything and had no money, no resources, nobody would lend to them. And so we designed a product for a solution for that. And so what we did is we realized you've got this massive untapped uh, experience out there that can do these projects consistently. And if it wasn't for the market and then being over, you know, having too much exposure at one time, which is the nature of building, it happens, you got to run when it goes um, uh, to, to capitalize as much as you can. But we created a product where we actually provided a, a loan structure that provided the entire capital stack to these fix and flippers out there. And so what we did is we teamed up with a hedge fund behind us. And so our loan product was up to 80% of the completed value. And we provided the acquisition money, the rehab repair and six months of prepaid interest. And so that product really brought a lot of families back to work and got a lot of the job force here in California going again, where they had no opportunity. And they were doing quite well. And so that product, the way that it was designed that makes sense for us is that we did a loan of up to 50% of the value mm -hmm. and they had six months of prepaid interest already. And then we, we found a hedge fund to come in behind us. We, sh we so showed them the business plan of how this would work and they did a profit split with the borrower behind us. So they would give the borrower 70% of the profit if they could do it in three months. And then for each month thereafter, 5% went more to the hedge fund side. And so we did, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars of those transactions. And then that product evolved. And as the, you know, the fix and flip cosmetic ones were gone, then they went to what's called, uh, you know, more scalable or adding square footage and then eventually ground up construction. So we led the market in that, that sector and brought wow. that whole new product. So in that scenario, it was thinking of a new product. When we came to cannabis, it wasn't, it wasn't a new product. It was a new asset class. Mm -hmm. So I want to just, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of reiterate what you said. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. So, wow. So what you saw in 2010, after that, the economic crisis of the housing market, right? You saw that there were gaps and there were people that of course were hurt by that crisis. And a lot of starting with the fix and flip people, right? The, the restoration, the remodeling type. So within these, these loans for real estate, you would kind of package them up in a product to where um, there was money that was secured for renovation, for flipping, and that gave incentive to the borrowers and the lenders to make sure that that work was fulfilled until releasing more of the money that they that they lent to them. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's a pretty good summary for a guy not in the in the industry. So what we <laughs> basically did is is for people that didn't have any money left and weren't, weren't uh, bankable borrowers anymore, we provided the entire capital, the money for the purchase and the money for the budget. And we would dole out that every time that they did some work, we would go out and do an inspection and we release those funds right. and uh, continue to pay the contractors and everything along the way. So yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Awesome. And then from there, it sounds like the product evolved, right? Because from the, fir the, the fix and flip, you went to, like you said, um, expansion, scaling, um, adding square footage, or even actually building, yeah. you know? Okay. Yeah. So you're going to take the low hanging fruit first, because those sure. ones are easier to do, smaller budgets. Um, there was a lot of iterations of that product. Um, you know, in uh, most lenders in California, if they're raising the money from private investors would stay under a million dollars. And we figured out a way to get over that million up to 2.5 million. And 
I don't, I don't, it's too much nuance for, for, for this podcast. It would be more for Elaine, for people that are interested on, on just real estate lending. But all of those things, we were, the, we were forward leaning and figuring out how to design and create those products. Now, this was not a new sector. It was an, un, it was an idle sector that nobody was figuring out how to deploy the capital to people that had the experience to do it. Right. It's basically you guys solved a problem that no one kind of saw at that at the time, given the circumstances, right? Yeah. And and the current market that we yeah. were in. And so so then you kind of sounds like you just basically tr- translated what you had done with with product development and ideation within the housing market crisis time period into cannabis because you saw that there were a lot of challenges and red tape when it came to borrowers and lenders in the space. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not quite it's apples to apples. It is in a way, I guess. So the problem that we were solving for in the housing crisis was um, the, the borrowers didn't have a, a, enough equity to, to close the transactions. And the, the problem that we, that we were solving for with the cannabis market was actually, they all had equity, enormous amounts of equity. This is the largest uh, asset class with, with, that has already been purchased and, and traded out there with no debt on it. So it's the actual opposite on that side. So what we were actually trying to do in this circumstance is that we felt that we had the expertise to, to reduce the amount of equity that these companies that were having to raise that equity, selling their blood, sweat, and tears to investors as equity at their lowest, most vulnerable time, we were willing to provide them debt and to reduce that amount of equity that they needed to, to, uh, to raise. And so that was our strategy there. Got you. And and how did the the market respond to that at first? Like, did it seem like a godsend to some of your clients? Like, what what was well, their reaction? Yeah, it's interesting. So, most cannabis operators have never done a construction loan, so they didn't realize yeah. it was a godsend. Right. So, and I'll tell you why. So most people have only in their lives been associated with possibly a mortgage for their own house or heard about a mortgage for their parents or their friend's house. And so in that scenario, the only two things you know of are the rate that you borrowed the money at. And if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you might want to know what the costs were. Um, but most people only think, even listen to only count on the rate. Um, but in reality, that is not apples to apples. That is a acquisition or refinance. That's not a construction loan. And so um, when we started to roll out uh, lo- uh, you know, loans on this side, the people that were the, 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 the borrowers had no clue what the cost of private money is. So, private, so you had a, a, a new universe of borrowers that only had to only dealt with institutional banks. And so they had sticker stock. Mm-hmm. And that... And, and on top of that, during this time, you have all these lenders out there that are issuing LOIs saying that we can do this transaction for 9% or 10%. And so all these LOIs are floating out there and the borrowers, and we were issuing a transact cost at you know, 12, and then we continue to raise our, our prices because our, the demand with capital is so high. And I'll get into that a little bit more later, but um, the, uh, the, 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 we were seeing all these LOIs come in from other lenders and we would, we use data to analyze what we're doing. We don't just say, ah, oh, that, you know, okay, we better reduce our pricing. Well, so we went out and tracked those lenders. We went out and pulled the data to see if we could find any uh, of these lenders of close on any cannabis use property. There was none. So we're like, we're not gonna compete to these with our with the borrowers coming to us saying, hey, we've got this, this, and this. We say, well, great, get have them p- provide you a closing, a final closing statement showing that they've closed one. Right. We're, we're going to lend our, our capital out. We're not going to uh, uh, negotiate against some LOI of some guy that's never closed. And so that originally, um, Candescent was a good story. It took them like nine months to come to terms with our pricing. And they went through four dozen LOIs. They went to loan docs like four times and paid upfront due diligence fees. The property they were purchasing had uh, you know, backup offers. They had an earnest money deposit that was going hard. They weren't going to get another extension. And they're like, all right, we're over it. We're going to close. And every time our pricing was going up because the demand for capital was so much more, you know, we were getting our name was getting out there and we were the only ones closing. So finally we closed on that transaction. So it used to take about nine, six to nine mo- months for the borrowers to realize that all these other term sheets weren't real. And then now that we have 
more time has passed and we've done so many transactions, we have a 100% closing ratio. It doesn't matter what your pricing is. If you don't close the transaction, it, it right. could be zero and it doesn't matter. Right. But now people realize that it's not the pricing that's the most important. It's one you can close, but just as importantly, how quickly you can process those draws. So cannabis properties do on average, the, the tenants do 10 to 15 times more revenue per month than a trip uh, than a typical non-cannabis tenant. So in one month they're doing more than the entire year for a, another guy. So what that really is, what that really means is the faster you can get that property built and fully stabilized and generating cash flow, that, that's a factor of your cost. So if Candescent, we processed 90 draws in 12 months, we probably saved them at least two months, probably six months in build time because we would process unlimited draws in one to three days. Our best in class private other private lenders do it in four to five days. So it doesn't sound like a whole lot between one to three days and four to five days. Let's just call it one day disparity. If we process 90 days and we save them one day on all 90 of those draws, that's three months. Right. And then two, two million a month. That's six million dollars. That's the number you should be concerned about, not the difference between two points, which was a uh, you know it, just over a hundred thousand dollars. Right. right. You you gave me an aha moment when you talk about like, you know, the value proposition of, you know, the the closing of the transaction and then the speed. Right. Like and and when I think about what you're saying about how a cannabis operator makes that much more in revenue or for a tenant than than their, their traditional tenant. Right. Was it two to three times more or, or three to, to four? Fifteen times. Ten we to ten to fifteen times. Right. We have a word for it. Orders of magnitude. <laughs> right, right. And see, that's where I was, as you were talking at the beginning about Polaris and your, your value proposition, value add. And it's like, it makes so much sense with that model, because if you have the right team in place, the product will sell itself, really. I mean, you got to, of course, have the right management team in place, the right business plan, strategy, execution. But like if you can incentivize these borrowers to to work with you in certain aspects of because you know they're going to be successful if they can if they can stick to the plan basically is what i'm saying right yeah um, we 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 underwrite all that so it's still too their cannabis is different than traditional borrowers this is the most complicated borrower set that there is in the universe these guys are having to figure out brand right. inventory management compliance um, uh, testing all these things that are all new and trying to be worked out. And so because of that super high level of, of potential failure, mm -hmm. we don't have the luxury of working with anybody. We have to work with somebody that's already got a proven track record. We can't just start out with somebody and hope that they make it. Right. They're going to have to, have, they're going to have had to have leased a place first and gotten their business model and show that they've got a track history. So we can only go so far that we can lean into it. Um, uh, you know, we wouldn't just do a brand new startup to see if, if it worked out. Right, right. And do you foresee maybe getting into that space in the future? Or I guess there will be somebody that will come in and help the the, the, the startup kind of Yeah, so it's, it, it kind of works itself out. And this is why. A startup is not going to go out and raise money for the largest possible expenditure in the first part of their business plan, which is right. real estate. Right. They're going to raise just enough money to get the brand going and to start developing a product. And eventually they'll have to get a place. They'll probably work out of their garage or something first. And eventually they'll get a, a, a warehouse and they'll, they'll be at that warehouse. At a certain point, they're going to get to a scale and size that they're not comfortable uh, in the being at the whims of some landlord and they're going to want to get their own they may go on to decide to get their own real estate or they need to put so much money into real estate that they don't own that it doesn't make economic sense at this point i'm raising you know and just so you know the the tenant improvements for cannabis are orders of magnitude higher too okay. so it's typically like you know, 200 to $300 a square foot, which is more than the purchase price of the property. So what happens is, as you start raising money from your investors to continue the expansion of your place, your investors are saying, why are we putting so much money into this property and tenant improvements that we don't own? Mm -hmm. At a certain point, you're like, okay, we should probably not put all this money into somebody and, and give them that value. We should probably consider putting it into our own. So that's the where that delta shifts.
Yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, it's a it's a crawl, walk, run, right? When it comes to business, and you're not yeah. gonna you know put all your investment dollars in something that you're not even ready to scale for. Yeah, or, yeah. Or your investors would to. be like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So you mentioned Candescent as a brand that y'all have helped support. What other company, notable companies, have you worked for, and and what was the you know the the way in which you went about it? Sure. So um, Ken Desson is a local uh, brand here in California, and now and they're they they're, they're a multi-state operator now. Um, we've had a really good relationship. And by the way, the cannabis borrower universe is a community which is different than any other aspect of lending, which is kind of nobody knows each other. So cannabis, all the borrowers know each other or know of each other, or have had the same similar, similar struggles. So it's a community and that's different. That's really interesting dynamic that happens there because once one guy vouches for you, the rest are like, okay, we don't like banks. We don't like guys in suits, but these guys, they helped me and they got, they, now I vouch for them. And, and Candescent really has done that. It's been a really great relationship. We take a lot of our investors to that facility probably once a quarter. I was just out there um, a week or two ago with a bunch of investors and it's a, it's a really good thing. Um, some of the other brands that you may know of Acreage Holdings we did last quarter uh, in Illinois, we've done Tikkun Olam, uh, which is the most well-known you know, research uh, 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 company out of Israel. We did their facility to, uh, for California. We built that one out. Um, we've done so most of the other ones you may not know yet. They're not on the radar. Um, we're, we're probably closing one this month that you guys would know, but I can't announce that until that one closes. But, um, you know, we started small too, um, cause you can't afford to make big mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we started with million dollar loans, $2 million loans today. We're doing, you know, $10 million, $15 million, $20 million loans. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, just to kind of show the the evolution and the growth, even for Polaris in that time frame, you know, you're doing bigger deals and whatnot, which is just kind of shows to your value proposition and your model that we've, we've yeah. talked about, you know? Yeah. So, so we've talked about the borrower side. There's another side of the company, which is the investor side and the management of all that stuff and the processing of all that. So it, it, we have about 250 investors that all have about a million dollars committed to us. So a quarter of a billion dollars that we have available to deploy capital into deals, non-cannabis. Of all those investors, we've made them millions and millions and millions of dollars. When we pivoted to cannabis, we got like four. To, and these are guys that we know. Like, <laughs> and we're like, okay. And so I thought, what's the, what's the hesitancy, the stigma, the federal regulation, like what, what is it? So most of our investors are guys that have real estate, made money in real estate, either buying, developing or, or lending themselves. And now they've just decided I'd rather Rob do it for me and it'd be passive income because they make me almost as much as I make when I go out and do it all myself. Mm -hmm. And so um, what was the, the issue is remember this is in 2014 and every year things are evolving massively. And so what happens is, is that but I usually don't even get a chance to make the case before they say no. And I, my job, I'm not a salesman. I'm a, I use data and, and analytics. We didn't have enough analytics at the time to be able to support our thesis. In fact, our first transaction, the only way we even got it done is the guy was worth lots and lots and lots of money. And he had, he was a friend of mine and he had been in the business and never even told me. I had no idea. And he knew we were, we were entering the space. And finally, one day he's like, hey, I actually own a cannabis brand and I have a whole portfolio of cannabis properties. I'm like, oh, really? He goes, but I'd like to, to use the equity in all the properties that I own to acquire a bakery to expand my edible line. I'm like, okay, well, why would, why, we always ask, why do you want to borrow the money? I don't want to put any post-tax money into this investment when I have millions and millions of dollars of equity sitting there. It doesn't make sense. I just borrow against the equity. So that was our first transaction, very easy sell. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of broke the seal. We got all the, there's other things that you have to get nuanced through. You have to figure out title insurance. You have to get title to sign off on it. You got to get escrow to sign off. You got to get your property insurance. You got to have your loan docs built for it. You got to get everything down the line. So it's, 
it's a little bit more complicated. And a lot of lenders thought they could do it and they go to close and they realize that, that even if they were able to manage to raise the money and if they disclosed it to their investor that that's what it's going into, there's other issues that you have to think through and most of them couldn't get through those. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel that's the case today. Um, but that's kind of some of the evolution. So to, just to finish that story real quick, I spent a year thinking I could educate those investors, uh, our existing investors, and move them towards to, to coming into this side of the business. And it just wasn't happening at the velocity that we needed to, to, to go. So eventually we switched that strategy and we launched a fund and we targeted cannabis equity investors because they do understand it. And we were just simply getting a different allocation. Mm -hmm. um, look, if you're going to be in cannabis, do you want 100% in equity? You know, right. this is still a highly risky business. You might get a 10x return and you might get a zero return. So our strategy is, look, maybe diversify 10% of that into debt so it's secured. So you're in this cannabis sector, you get monthly distributions and you might get some upside some, here and there, some other things as well. So right. that was our strategy. But the part that's difficult there, cannabis investors have an expectation. They want to... They want to be part of the cannabis community too. And debt's not sexy. And 15% yield is astronomical is what our net yield is for a fund. But for cannabis, when you're looking for a 10X return, 15% per year is not that sexy. Now, I just ran the numbers. Our fund's been open for three years. We've done, we've returned 80% of, 87% of the capital of the initial principal has been returned thus far. So if you had 100,000 day one, you've already received 87,000 plus you still have your 100,000. That's pretty pretty good, solid returns. Um, but for equity, you know, most people wanna, a lot of people wanna hit, hit, shoot the moon. <laughs> right, to the moon as they say, right? Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, no, but but that that does make sense, and and it speaks to your track record. Three years, and and you know, eighty seven, you say eighty seven thousand dollars or eighty seven percent, right? So yeah, that's, that's just huge. the fund. We've been yeah. we've been doing deals in this sector for four years um, now. It, the, it took off once we finally got it to work. It took off so fast that we had to create a, a fund structure to be able to be to make it happen more. Uh, to make the back end of the company work better and be able to deploy more capital. So um, it's, that's the return uh, for just the fund. Right. Prior to that, we were doing what's called standalone transactions where we raised the money from family offices and our private investors. And we, it's called syndicating it. We bundle all that together. We have to do the due diligence with each individual group and we have to, it's, it's a lot. Got you. Got you. Well, and you know, when you first, when we first started talking, I know that you, you mentioned kind of how this, transition happened and where Pilaris felt themselves found themselves in the cannabis industry was really sh started by that amendment that was passed right and you talked about how um, the DEA or the federal government could not penalize ancillary companies who were serving cannabis companies in the me in medical states right yeah, yeah. and so, so you go correct. ahead the Department of Justice which is uh, who the DEA is underneath correct thank you yes and so um, given that example, you know, there's talks of reform at the federal level, you know, first and foremost, the safe banking, which we've heard Senate uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer been talking about that should be coming, quote unquote, soon, right. Um, but also is the talks about reforming uh, or removing 280E, right, yeah. that that horrible IRS tax provision. Um, so when I talk to things about that, and even talks of of descheduling cannabis. Yeah. Does that in any way affect Polaris's business model moving forward, the deschedule yeah. approach as opposed to maybe rescheduling? Yeah, so you talked about a lot of categories there. So I'll try to chip away at them. The easiest one first. So we've competed against the, the, the deregulation of it or, or legalization of cannabis doesn't affect us uh, negatively in any way. We've competed against banks for our entire career. So because we're a bridge lender, the bridge, the banks can't do that. And we have case studies of why, even if you had a 6%, we have a case study with can, with uh, acreage, they had to pay to 16%, even if they were to pay 6% or 10% disparity, the, the pricing of our loan is makes, it, they, they're in the money after one week of, uh, if we save them one week in time. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's not an issue for us. Um, the next issue, uh, 280E, I think this is the spot that, that everybody should be fo focused on. So 280E does take Congress to, uh, to change that code. 
that's a lot easier to, to focus on that lane. That would be the most significant thing for all of these companies to be able to write off mm -hmm. their uh, expenses federally. It's massive. It's right. so massive. Um, and I don't think that there would be any headwinds on that. Um, so I think that the, the biggest headwind would be on that is what happens on the Democrat side is that they are all trying to utilize the, um, the, the oxygen, the air in the room uh, on the media to bolster themselves. And so if, if somebody comes out and says, I'm pushing for 280E to make it, to, to make it legalized, we're gonna go down that lane. The next Democrat's gonna say, uh, Ocasio will say, that's excellent. I agree. We need to do this, but we need to have, we also need to have it so that anybody that's currently in jail needs to be released as well. And so now you've got enough, now you're conflating decriminalization with tax code mm -hmm. and it's two separate universes, even though it happens to do with laws and cannabis. And so right. it gets more complicated. Uh, and then the next one will say, yes, we need to do both of those, but we need to let everybody out and have re reparations as well. Right. And so you, you lose the, the other senators that were willing to vote for that. You start losing them. They're like, I don't know if I want to, I'm not willing to put a vote out there um, and, and it, it not go through. So the reason that Chuck Schumer is not bringing it to the floor vote, vote is he doesn't have, they don't have the votes. So it's that simple. Um, I, I always say that if the Biden administration was truly pro-cannabis, day one, they would have signaled it. They would have reinstated the coal memo or something similar, and they didn't. And so that would have been the easiest signal, just like Seth Sessions did. He unilaterally um, uh, uh, rescinded the coal memo. That would have been a signal to the rest of the industry of what their position was. Um, but to go a little bit more nuanced than that, you've only got another three or four months of political capital left before it goes to the midterms. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the Democrats are going to lose big time. Um, they're holding on by a sliver in the Senate. And they only got, I think, 14, I can't remember exactly, 14 or 17 uh, majority in the House. And they went so far uh, progressive on everything that they're doing because they the reason they're going so crazy and trying to get all this through is because they know that they're probably not going to have uh, the majorities anymore. So they got to right. go as fast as they can. Right. And I think that, that, as you, that their window is going by. Um, that's unfortunate because you could, you could get bipartisan support. Cory Gardner um, uh, from Colorado, ex-senator of last, last term, he did this co-sponsor of the States Act with Elizabeth Warner. He's, I've had lunch with him many times. He said that during uh, the Trump administration, he said that he had the votes. He had enough votes on the Senate side. That's the part that's hard. The House is easy. Everybody could get every single bill through the House. No problem. <laughs> right, right. It's the Senate side. But because it was election, um, uh, uh, it's, it was election cycle, he, the same thing with 280E because the other people, other co, uh, Democrats running for president wanted the oxygen. As soon as Elizabeth Warren and him announced that they were going to go for it, they wouldn't have been able to whip up the votes that were necessary to get to pass the, the 60, 60 vote uh, filibuster. And it's because the same thing, uh, Corey, you know, uh, so other senators that were running for president. Um, it became were, politicized at that point. Became, so yeah, that's what, right. everybody misses that part. <clears throat> Politics is, you no, know, the Democrats and the Republicans right now, neither of them want to give a win to the other side at all. <laughs> right, and, right. And, at the right. cost of whatever it is for the country. Right. And it's so, so unfortunate. So, you know, 280E is an easy one. I think they could get that through. Um, I wish they would focus there because that would make a huge difference. And it's really, it's an easy one to do. It's just allowing that, uh, that, that, that portion of the law to not impact if, it's, if, it, if that state is federally legal, um, that, that, that they should be able to do it. So right. I, I'm, I think that it'll happen eventually. I, I just don't know when Congress is gonna agree on anything. Um, and so that's the part that, that's, that's tough for me to prognosticate about. You articulated that very well. I, I agree with you uh, in everything that you said. I mean, it, it has, I, I truly do believe that cannabis legalization or even reform and you're even decriminalizing at, a, at the lowest level is a bipartisan issue. And we've seen that throughout the states, right? We're seeing that whether it's a red state or a blue state, 
the the state officials are seeing the benefits of legalizing for a number of different reasons, right? One one of which is the economic impact, of course, the tax revenue, um, and, and and doing right by, behind the people who have been locked up in the past for this plant. Now that states are online and legally selling, right? I think that you made a really good point in the way you said it, and that is if the Biden administration had cannabis legalization as its top priority, they would have already said that they would have done it. And I I think that they ran on on that on that, not on the premise of legalization, but more so on the restorative justice, you know, restorative justice aspect of it, the racial injustice aspect of it. But even then, we haven't seen much movement from the expungement side. Right. And so it just kind of bleeds up to, again, I don't think that for this administration, cannabis is top priority for them and they may need to be pushed. And like you said, you know, the Senate, the, the different uh, officials within those, the House and the Senate, maybe they can do something. But right now there's a disconnect, it seems like, so, you know, let's, let's just take it a little bit more uh, granular. The first p- place that prosecutorial discretion comes is at the local level. So as, as a law is discovered that it's being broken, is it state or federal? It, you know, in the state, the local people know about it first before the federal in most cases. Right. Now, so it's already being, it, that prosecutorial discretion at the state level that the states that are uh, uh, cannabis medical license or recreational license, it's already there. So then the next element is, okay, well, what about the federal? Is, is the, and and you have, there's no cases of, cannabis uh, being prosecuted at the federal level that I know of, it would be a massive political backlash if it happened. So in essence, it's already happening. No feds are going to go, the feds aren't going to use their uh, their efforts to go down that road um, unless there's another aspect of it. And it usually comes down to money laundering because cannabis is a very easy place to wash around a lot of money. You could buy a property for pay cash. There's all kinds of things that you could do to legitimize um, drug money that was mm-hmm. from ill gains and, and wash it through. So um, I, I don't, I think that um, that chip away, chip away at the outside edges, chip away at the things that help the companies. Decriminalization is different from deconflicting from federal policy. So one is going forward and one is from what happened in the past. And so to the, the states are doing with it on their own for, for the people in jail from breaking state law. So the last one is is the um, uh, the federal policy. So I believe there was a, a law passed uh, that during Trump administration to do that, um, and I I don't know what the the Democrats are are doing um, uh, to to go down that road again. I don't know how much political capital is being expended on on to reform and go go that way. Um, I've mentioned you know the Biden administration. I mentioned the Trump administration. I'm not for one or the other, but it seems like the, the Biden administration and the Democrats do a lot of talking <laughs> and nothing is coming through. They right. talk about all the stuff that Schumer, I'm having the parade here in New York. Right. Uh, we're bringing this through, 420's coming. But in reality, they haven't passed anything to, no. to, to, to do it. So the only reason I mentioned that criminal reform is we know people who are affected by that. And so <laughs> right. that one did something, but there was nothing... That should have been a huge celebration from all of the people that in this that have been impacted by this, and you know it's just it's all political, and that's what's sad. I feel like our whole country is becoming this just ridiculous public thing that that it's all about attacking the person and no nothing for for us the people that are that are that these laws would impact. Hundred percent, man. I I couldn't agree more. And just one last point to wrap this up, and it's just another point that you made that's just really good. And that is maybe taking the approach of chipping away, and and that low hanging fruit that you're talking about, starting there and then letting the conversation kind of open from there, right? Like, okay, well, what else can we do? Two eighty seems like a natural first step. It just makes sense. There are states that are illegal. These these operators, these businesses are really really hamstrung by. Um, not being able to write off their tax deductions. I mean, as simple as having an employee, you can't write that person off. It's just insane, right? And so starting there would be good and then just kind of figuring it out. But but you know, one thing I've seen the states, I've, I've did my best to follow um, states that have passed adult use. And I know my home state, New Mexico, the approach that they took, they wanted to go really, really heavy on the social 
um, the restorative justice aspect of their bill, right? But they found, to your point, within the within the Senate, when they're trying to 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 pass to get it on the governor's desk, it's a it's a blue state. You've got the Democratic Party, who's who's there's a section of the of uh, the Democratic Party that's being super progressive, or at least trying to push super progressive policies, and that is kind of you know causing this uh, internal debate between the Democratic Party. What they did in New Mexico was they completely removed that social justice component of the bill and they made it a standalone bill mm -hmm. so they they said okay we're gonna we're gonna focus on the regulations for for legalization of cannabis in new mexico here's how we're gonna regulate it here's how we're gonna issue licenses oh and then we're gonna have a separate bill that speaks to all the people that were affected mm -hmm. by the prohibition of cannabis you know Sweet. And, and, and it hasn't, it's only been a couple of months since that's passed, but uh, we'll see, I guess time will tell how that work played out, you know. Yeah. To, to speak to that point, um, so usually that social justice um, aspect or equity comes in on the licensing and they're trying to, to, you know, give the licensing priority to people that have been affected. The government solutions always have a backlash that, that you need to think through. So for a, a lender that's going to provide capital or an equity uh, group, you can't lend to somebody as a criminal. You got <laughs> you got a problem. Right. You can't lend, you would, and, and you wouldn't. That's lend such to a somebody. great point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and you wouldn't lend to somebody that has no experience. So you're going right. to give this guy money at, if the. So this is politicians. We need to repurpose this and give, which I think is a great idea. So I'm going to give my idea that I think is the correct way to do it. But you, you, just, you just said, okay, we're doing all this and then nobody puts any money out and it doesn't work. And you're like, why isn't anybody doing anything here? Did you have something to say? Well, and just to add to that, that's what I thought. Like with, with this push on, like, like for your example, more access to licenses for people that have been racially unjust by the plant, right? Like how, I, I think that it'd be more beneficial to maybe put the tax revenue of the money that you're getting from cannabis sales into maybe infrastructure, public education, programs to help people actually better and improve their lives. I don't know if everybody wants to be a hemp or cannabis farmer, you know, yeah. um, and it's very expensive to do so, right? Yeah, so I, I agree with that. But I think that when you are trying to pass a bill through, when you make it broad like that, the politicians on are lose the the feel good of what they're trying to push through. So there's a lot of political goodwill that comes associated with the social justice reform, the social justice, which I think is good. My suggestion would be that whatever you do, I would be more than happy to roll out a program where we educate people before they even have a chance to get a license on <laughs> what they would do with it. That, which, okay, which, yes, which, absolutely. Which we're doing here right now, explaining right. to you the debt and how you, like if I gave a million dollars to somebody that had never been in business before in a brand new industry where the most sophisticated guys on the freaking planet are still struggling, he's probably not gonna work out. But, right. but if we educate them, we teach them how to do that and who to team up with and what to do, now they've got a shooting chance. All you're doing is setting people up for failure. Mm -hmm. So there might be a small universe of people that had experience and were illegal operators that might work out, but it's such a small universe that that's what your program is relying on, good luck. So right. I think that there's a, I think that that you need to educate the people um, and there should be a, a system where people are achieving certain levels of success within that program. And as they get to the top of that program and graduate in that program, now they've got guarantees uh, that they can bring in. They have a, that now they've, they've qualified to be able to get a, a, a license or they've qualified for a state guarantee to be able to back that loan. And, you know, uh, those are the, those two things. If I, if I had that, I'd be like, okay, this guy's got this, he completed this program. He's teamed up with this guy. He got a, a, a bank guarantee from the, the state from that's backed by uh, an, a bond that came through from, from the taxes revenue. You know, I'm like, okay, that, I need some equity. I got the equity, I've got the experience. He's qualified here. He's proven himself. Maybe he had a, you know, as long as he didn't have financial crimes, we, can, we, actually, we could actually lend to that if we wanted to, but this is generally the tenant. So 
we're normally lending to the owner of the pro where we are all, always lending to the owner of the property. So it's it's not really directly to us, but if that if that uh, tenant happened to be an owner user, that we could get by that. Right. That, that's such a good, I think such a good approach because it, it's basically kind of, it's what I said, but it's more concentrated what you're saying in their overall goal, which is to have more people of color, people that were disenfranchised by the plant, be operators and be successful, right? Give them an opportunity. But how do you do that without the proper guidance, the proper education? Because even outside of cannabis, business is hard, right? And this is the most complex industry of business that there is. So to just kind of open the floodgates and say, good luck, I, I don't know if that's enough. And I, I like your approach, Rob, I want, as we wrap up, I want to give you the floor and I want you to just, you know, whatever's top of mind with you, why don't you tell um, our audience, you know, maybe what, what Polaris is looking for in the future, what, what you're envisioning in terms of the future of cannabis. I'm going to leave it to you, man. What are, what are your sure. final thoughts? Well, thanks. You know, luckily we've touched, touched about a, a lot of new things uh, that, that are, you know, as I speak on different panels and uh, podcasts and things like that, like this new education program is what our, our current position is. And previously we didn't have a position on that. So we did touch on, on a lot of the things and, and the things that I wanted to get across, we hit on most of those. Um, I would probably say where we want to see things go for us as a company is that we're currently only focused on, on the very high performance, which is another word for costly, bridge loans to get those properties stabilized. But where, where we're headed is that we're gonna develop another lending product that will be a, a lower cost, medium term um, uh, place to, to refinance to lower cost, sustainable uh, costing uh, until the banking gets, until uh, institutional lending gets more worked out. So that's where we're headed. We're probably gonna come out with what we call an operator loan. At some point, we have to create a new vehicle uh, for these other products that I'm mentioning because it's a different channel of capital um, and that becomes plant touching. But we, we feel that, that um, if we could avoid the cannabis operator having to purchase this property, um, one of the ways that we could do that is, is even if you're a tenant in leasing a property, we could provide you a, a method to a borrow um, on, with that business and to provide a, a, a way of, of acquiring the money for the tenant improvements and the equipment, um, at least until you can get enough capital and, and track record to raise the capital to go buy a property. So. Those are some of the things that we're working on. Um, I already touched a little bit on the, the data that we use. Um, you know, we do track all the, the cannabis operators in each state. We, we track what type of license they have. We track what properties they're in. We track who, they're, who the owners of those properties are. We track uh, who the lenders are, if any. We track the foreclosures. We track new licenses. We track the building department. So we're using real life analytics in the sector because nobody else did it. So we know this is about a $50 billion market across the country right now. Nobody else really has extrapolated that with facts. And so we've pulled those facts, we've run our costs, we've run all that data into a dashboard. So this is some of the things that our, our, my other partners use in, in a dashboard um, to drill down and look at, at maps and things like this that we aggregate all that data. So that's some of the things that's interesting about this. There was nobody to do it. There was no hedge fund or, or, or BDS analytics or New Frontiers, they do it from the cannabis uh, brand side. Nobody was doing it on the, real, uh, on the real estate side. So some of the things that we're doing, that's kind of interesting. It's a huge differentiator. And you know, I've said it before, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So <laughs> right, right. the fact that the fact that you guys are, are data centric, data focused to, to make those informed decisions in business, man, that's it's a huge differentiator. And I really appreciate your time today, Rob. Um, you've definitely educated me. Uh, as I mentioned when we first recorded, like this is this is new subject matter to me, and uh, it was very very helpful. I know I got a lot out of it, and I know that the audience did as, did as well. So um, I'd love to have you back on and just talk yeah. politics in general, man. Like you're, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's it, we don't get enough of those conversations where we actually listen and just you know kind of go back and forth without having such a hard defined this is what i believe is what you believe so it's encouraging to have those uh those enlightening discussions man so thank you yeah i'm, I'm not always the most popular panelist co-panelist <laughs> because everybody else is like oh, i think it's gonna pass this next week right <laughs> and i'm like it might but this is why i think not <laughs> Right, right. Well, hey, Rob, where can people find your website and social media if they want to follow you guys and learn more? Sure. So, um, you know, you can see the name here. Uh, Polaris Equity Group is our name. Polaris is spelled slightly different there. They could go to our website. Um, 
you can contact me individually at Rob, R-O-B, at PolarisEquityGroup.com. Happy to, uh, you know, engage with your ball, with your, your podcasters or what, I don't know what you call them. These podcasters. <laughs> the audience, um, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if you want to learn more about our fund, happy to share that. Um, people can can reach out to me or, or go on our website and find more, more information about us. Um, there's all kinds of new other nuances we could go down on the next podcast, and I look forward to coming back. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, Rob. I look forward to having you back on soon. And thank you all for listening. All right. Thanks. Bye.